Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome back to the weekly market analysis for the week ending May 12th, 2023. And uh, starting off here looking at the S&P 500, before we jump into today's uh, weekly recap and analysis, I'd like to remind you to hit the like button if you enjoy the content that's being shared here and subscribe if you're not already. You can also find me on Twitter at Mr. J. Thomason and you can subscribe to my free uh, weekly uh, substack at befinanciallyfree.substack.com. Uh, I also do uh, occasionally post premium content that you if that you can access if you are a premium paid subscriber. So just want to mention that. You can find the links to both of those in the description below uh, for this video. And uh, while I would while I would say here to start out um, that the uh, I would say that the market um, is. Uh, has kind of recovered a little bit towards the close of trading today. Um, I believe my thesis right now is that a correction is coming. And when I say correction, I do mean in the normal market sense of the word that that means 10% approximately so. And I'm going to spend some time here in this video talking about why that is in just a moment. Uh, but to start off with, to just kind of recap where the markets are at today, we had the S&P 500 close the week at 41.38 on the dot. Uh, and uh, so we've kind of just been chopping in a sideways range. We basically have not gone anywhere since the end of March. Uh, so basically sideways for a month and a half. So um, it's frustrated both bulls and bears, I'm sure. Um, and uh, while I would say it hasn't been easy over the last few weeks to hold the position that I've had, um, as I've been saying for a couple of weeks, that a correction was coming, uh, obviously these things can take time. Uh, corrections, I will admit, can also just be sideways. So it's entirely possible that, uh, you know, I always want to be aware of that risk that the market will just go sideways before going up. Uh, but um, but I actually do believe that we're going to see S&P below 4,000 in the next few weeks. Um, and so I'll ex again I'll explain why that is. Uh, taking a quick look at the NASDAQ, uh, had mostly an up week, but still ended, uh, still came down today. Uh, and actually, we were down over 100 points at one point. But the NASDAQ, if we go to a Going to a one-minute chart will kind of show you how ridiculous uh, that this was. Um, we, you see this a lot, honestly. Uh, you know, the the market was down, and then suddenly at a you know what is this 2 p.m. Eastern? Uh, so in the last two hours of training uh, of trading, just kind of a grind to the upside. Um, so kind of retracing quite a bit of the fall, uh, and then as we went into uh, the uh, after hours, uh, you saw kind of it. Uh, price come off a little bit more, um, and trading view honestly sometimes has this bug where it adjusts the uh, the close price, so it's kind of off. Apologize about that, but Nasdaq closed up on the week, but um, had a down day today. Uh, finally, the Nasdaq, I think you're going to start seeing the weakness, uh, and and honestly, there there's not a lot of breadth in the market anyway. So, um, looking at the Dow, uh, the Dow has basically not moved since uh, November. Of 2022, it's had a little bit of up, a little bit of down, a little bit of up again, and now it's kind of coming off. Uh, if I put my tide indicator back up, um, it is kind of an interesting uh, spot because it did uh, come down below the uh, faded line when it comes to the tide indicator, and um, but uh, closed actually between the lines, and so uh, this is t usually on the long side. This is the type of area. Uh, where you would want or where you could uh, uh, you could have a good buying opportunity. But of course, because of my uh, I, I'm willing to stand to the side until things look a little bit more safe uh, because uh, I'm not willing to try to buy in here if the market's going to drop 10 percent. So uh, I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, the Russell also uh, just has had really poor performance since uh, since March or since uh, actually since early March. I uh, have basically been sideways since the banking crisis. Um, the dollar dollar had a couple of pretty big up days to end the week. Um, and so uh, kind of closing at, uh, I, I've expected this for some time, because uh, price never stays away from the tideline for that long or for, for very long. Um, 
can be a couple of months, but usually it's got to come back and make contact. So that's kind of what's happened. So uh, what I would say is that the, the dollar looks good in an uptrend, a, a small uptrend, I should say, up to over 103 and maybe up to 104. Uh, but of course, at that point, that's where the wise move would be to, to try to take a short, uh, to try to take dollar shorts. Um, the biggest moves have been in the, uh, uh, against the euro. Um, and so that's been where a lot of the DXY action has come from. Uh, so I want to call that out. Uh, the, uh, oops, the 10 year treasury yield here is, uh, sitting at four, three point four seven. 3.47. Um, I mentioned on Twitter, uh, that we were, that we finally, uh, got a bearish tide cross on the, uh, 10 year, which happened last back in, uh, let's see, back in, uh, let's see, August, uh, um, yeah, August of 2021, and then crossed back to the upside by October. So after another two months crossed up, uh, the, the previous time before that, where the cross actually meant bearish price action in the medium and long term, was back in January 2019, just after the, uh, the famous Powell pivot. Uh, so as far as I can tell, though, uh, even though the bond market started uh, especially in March um, with the banking crisis trying to price in uh, a Fed pivot and cuts uh, and a change in policy and, and potentially even a recession. We are seeing similar action here. Uh, it's not really going down. It just looks like it's consolidating for its next move. So we'll see uh, where that move goes. Gold uh, once again had a little bit of a spike, uh, but then has been sort of giving uh, some of it back. Uh, closing today at uh, $2,011. And uh, I, I, I hold that the, uh, I believe that the gold, uh, that gold will not make a new all-time high until 2024. I think people are getting a little too excited and, and demanding too much uh, out of gold right now, believing that it just has to go to new all-time highs now. These things can take time. Uh, so I don't expect it to, and, and I don't expect it to, uh, without... You know, like everyone keeps saying that, oh, we have to buy gold because when the Fed pivots, uh, then gold's going to moon. And, and that may be, but gold has to get hit by, uh, you know, gold is not immune to a liquidity crisis, just like in uh, March 2020 when it dropped. Um, you know, it did drop just like everything else. So gold cannot withstand that, uh, that kind of event. Um, and, and, I would expect to see a sell-off uh, with a broader market correction. Um, so I, I think people are right in the long term. This is just kind of a little, uh, like little uh, kind of side note here. I think that people are right when they say gold is going to break its all-time high and go up between you know 2200 and 2400 But I just don't think that it's going to happen on the time horizon that people keep saying without price coming off pretty substantially. Um, I would be looking for price to come down below 1900. It can do that pretty quickly, but I would be looking for price to come down below 1900 uh, before I think about it uh, having the uh, generating the next, you know, uh, bit of momentum to be able to take it up to all time highs. And it, and it could even take longer and it might even go lower. Uh, it really just depends. Um, and then crude oil, crude oil. Um, I've been taking victory laps. Uh, for, you know, I, I bought the bottom right here. I told you guys on my videos and in my newsletter, I sold too early because I was a little nervous. We obviously got the pop and this is in this area where I was saying, hey, this is shorting territory. Um, this is like prime shorting position right here. And then we sold off, basically retraced the entire move up, bounced a little bit and we've been coming off again. Uh, so as much as people keep trying to uh, put the bid under oil and as much as basically at every single one of these bounces everyone says this is it oil's going to 150 200 and beyond it's not happening yet and so uh, I continue to think that it's really interesting how oil looks like it's pricing in global slowdown and yet the equity indices are you know are pricing at least uh, recently uh, for the last few weeks have been priced as if we're getting the soft landing or the no landing. Uh, and so it's very interesting to see that. And then finally, Bitcoin, which has had a pretty considerable recovery on the day, uh, has uh, uh, is down uh, around 26,700 
six eight uh, had pre had dropped for a little bit below twenty six thousand, and I actually tweeted today on the price action that there are a lot of people who would get scared right uh, as price is doing this, but this is actually again in that buy zone. This is not the optimal buy zone. Optimal buy zone would be if price dropped closer to twenty four thousand. Um, but uh, as long as momentum is still to the upside, which it is, uh, so right now, I mean, this isn't really that. This isn't really anything to worry about on on Bitcoin, where you would really get concerned uh, would be if we made a, a lower low from um, probably under twenty thousand. If we if we made a lower low below that, that would be where we would be. We would get really con concerned. But you know, anything above that, it's perfectly fine. Um, I, I am expecting uh, Bitcoin and crypto to continue to correct, uh, and again, I'll explain why. But uh, in the obviously in the first ten minutes or so of this video, we've kind of reviewed where the markets are currently at. Now, I want to take some time to go over with you why I think that the correction that I've been talking about for some time uh, on obviously in these videos on Twitter and in my Substack, uh, why I believe that that is coming to fruition over the next couple of weeks. Um, so let me jump into this. So um, what I'm most proud of is that um, I just, uh, in the last few days, have been working on this study. Uh, and I'm going to try to explain this uh, as simply and quickly as I can. Uh, but basically what you're looking at here is the, a chart of the S&P 500 um, with an overlay. I'm calling it the risk overlay. So if you follow my newsletter, uh, then you know that I have a chart of a bunch of different risk proxies. And what I mean by risk proxy is... These are different crosses that uh, that suggest uh, kind of what markets are thinking as far as it relates to uh, uh, the uh, ability to or the, the desire to seek out higher risk in the market. So risk on environments, the crosses go one direction, risk off, they go a different direction. And I watch five risk proxies and uh, the main two that are of the most weight uh, are the high beta to low beta ratio and then the uh, ratio between junk debt and uh, and the uh, US treasuries and so what I've basically done is I've taken those and I've used my tide indicator as the proxy or as the as the method for this study um, and I've taken the uh, the tide indicator on both of those crosses and basically when so so I've, I talk a lot about the, my tide indicator, which is obviously the colored line with the gray line. And so basically what this means is on an asset like, say, uh, Bitcoin here, it, it's bearish uh, tide. It's bearish tide if the colored line is below the uh, faded line. That's the control line. And, and if it's above, it's bullish. Uh, and I worked really hard to develop that indicator. And so uh, it's formed the basis of... Uh, of the frame for um, my uh, for this uh, this risk overlay, and so what I've done is when I've taken the high beta low beta ratio and the junk to treasury ratio, and if both of them are bullish tied, then the the overlay creates green candles, and then if it's if they're both bearish, they generate red candles, and then if one of them is bullish and the other is bearish. Uh, on tide, then it creates a or generates a yellow candle. And what's really cool about this is if you go back, and obviously uh, on my the trading view charts, uh, it's kind of frustrating. Uh, on the trading view charts, the furthest back that these uh, indicators go or that the indicator will generate is only back to late 2011, and that's because of the fact that SP uh, S and P high beta, S and P low volatility, and then J and K S H Y, which are the 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 instruments that I use for this proxy um, don't go back any further together at least until uh, uh, before you know late 2011 um, and so the signals are a little wonky early in this uh, like in 2011 and in 2012 uh, but what you generally see is uh, what, I, what I was trying to do is trying to use these risk proxies to guesstimate exit points to avoid drawdowns because that's ultimately the goal here is to avoid uh, a drawdown and so these crosses are meant to demonstrate that the conditions uh, of the market 
are not conducive to taking risk and so you actually should reduce your risk and so what I did was I did this study it took me a while to to do and what I found and I'll, I'll pull this up right here uh, and what I found let me uh, if I maybe I can zoom it and I'll put it up on the top side here uh, if you look at um, uh, the top right of my screen here uh, basically using uh, uh, I had to do a study using Excel and otherwise um, but basically what I found is that when the uh, when that indicator, and again, I'm gonna have to pull it up again. When this turns red, all, my whole the whole point of the study was to see what happens when it turns red. And so uh, the result of the study was that the average change in the S and P 500 was minus four percent from the time that the that both crosses turned bearish, um, and from and until the time when one of them turned back to bullish. So. Uh, the average change in the S&P price was 4%, minus 4%. The median change was 0%. Uh, and then what I thought was really striking was that the average max drawdown return was 13%, which, which means that uh, it's kind of misleading. I'm sorry with the, the numbers here. Whoops, excuse me. Um, uh, but what this ultimately means in practice is that the average drawdown uh, the average max drawdown across all of the uh, times when the when the two uh, proxies crossed bearish was uh, the average um, drawdown was 13 percent which is what I suspected to be the case uh, but I could not confirm until I did this study and this study goes back to the mid 90s uh, so obviously my study here goes back a lot further than what the trading view chart allows you to do. Um, but it's, it's much more telling when you do this study. Um, and I've been really, uh, really proud of this study. Um, and what was really shocking, uh, and I actually posted on, uh, on Twitter, I think I can pull this up. It'll take me a second. Uh, so I wrote a big post about it. Uh, and I want to highlight this section right here. Um, the, uh, the largest drawdown was 42%. And so the, the, basically, if I, if I kind of set it right here on my screen, the benefit of this strategy, so, so we always wanna be thinking of how does, what, what is this actionable for? Like what, what can I do with this information? Well, what it tells you is when this crosses to the red, when these candles turn red, that tells you that you need to get out. Uh, that tells you that you need to severely reduce your risk uh, in the markets and potentially completely exit. And if you're really ambitious, you could short, um, but it, shorting is really hard. I mean, think about how the 22, uh, 2022 bear market was, um, but it means you should get out. And so everybody wants to know, okay, well, what happens if you get out? Because you look at something like, at, like this you know, it looks like, oh, it turns red, and then the next time it turns yellow, the market is actually higher. And that's true, right? That's true. And, and even here, like, it turned red, but the market went up a little bit more. Um, and right here, it turned red, the market went up, and then it turned back to yellow, then turned back to red. But the point is, it's not, uh, you, you're, you're trying to cut off your left tail risk. You're trying to cut off the drawdown potential. Um, and so, like, I, I put this in the tweet, um, uh, you know, when you exit the market, it might have the risk of making you re-enter at a higher level. But on average, again, because of what this study showed me, the average change, you're much more likely, like the, the probability of you getting back in the market at the same price or lower is actually much higher than the possibility or the probability of you buying in higher. So, uh, so I think that that's a really big deal. But then also the benefit of the strategy, and I listed off these drawdowns, the seven major drawdowns that we've weathered over the last 20 years what are have been minus 32%, minus 42%, minus 15%, minus 13%, minus 19%, minus 29%, and minus 20%. So while the study shows you here that the average max drawdown was 13%, um, and that the median was seven percent. That me like there are some there are some really big drawdowns that you would have to endure uh, in order to 
uh, you know, you'd have to weather through a lot of these drawdowns. And, and human psychology, you know, what's the likelihood of, of you staying in the trade through a 32% drawdown or through a 42% drawdown? And what I also thought was very prescient about this is, and it's really easy to see on this chart, like, I mean, look at in 2022. The, the candle turns red at the exact same point that the market tops in uh, at the beginning of January 2022. So you could have gotten out at the exact point where the market was the most expensive and basically preserved all of your capital through this entire drawdown. So I think that's worth it. I think that is is the key here, right? So you want to be able to minimize your drawdown and preserve your capital so that when it's time to buy again, when it's safe to buy again, um, then there's plenty of money to be made and you actually have the capital to deploy. So, I mean, think about this. Think about the the peace of mind that you have knowing that, hey, you can get out of the market here and maybe, maybe, you, uh, maybe you get in higher. Like if you waited till this turns green, maybe you wait till then. Like sure, you're buying in higher, but man, like look at the certainty, look at the peace of mind that you have all the way up towards the top of the market into late 2021. And to me, that's worth it. You get that all over the place. Uh, so I do want to call that out. And having spent all this time now talking about that, I just want to point out that look at what's happening. This, this weekly candle turned red. So while obviously there are no guarantees, this means that the risk of, again, going back to the study, the risk of a 13% on average drawdown is pretty high right now. Okay, so I want to point that out. So like having explained all of that, uh, I think that's one reason why there is a correction that I think is going to be uh, imminent uh, and actually finally working its way into the markets over the next few weeks. Uh, that's one reason why. Another reason why is the global liquidity, uh, which, I mean, like, the, if you just look at the chart here, what I did was S&P is white. Um, I added the NASDAQ, which is in pink, um, and then Bitcoin, which is gold, and then the global liquidity is blue. And what you see here is that global liquidity has been trending down while the other markets have been trending up. More often than not, the all of the other colored lines go and are like they're the blue line is like a magnet for those other lines so what does that mean right now through this lens the s p should go down to about 3930 or so the nasdaq should fall to about 12,300. so that's about a thousand uh points lower than where it currently is bitcoin should go to about 23,000, um and i don't know like m maybe it won't but when like one of the things you have to think about when you're going through the markets is you have to you can't just go off of one indicator you have to stack indicators together and in this case when you're looking at this information when you have the risk proxy which is showing you like which is back tested by the way it's back tested and it's showing you that we are in a risk off condition and then you are looking at the global liquidity, which has basically dictated the direction of the market for a while. And and I mean, let's even if you go back, like go back before March 2020 and tell me that liquidity didn't still drive the market just all the way back. Liquidity drives the market, drives the market, drives the market. Basically, since the GFC, liquidity has driven the market. And so are you telling me that now suddenly here in 2023 that this time now that now suddenly liquidity doesn't matter i don't think so uh so you know with all that said um i i expect these lines to come down and meet global liquidity which even though there has been some emergency lending and discount window lending that has taken place at this week um liquidity in china and elsewhere is dropping like a like a rock and so that's offsetting what is happening here. And then we also have to worry about the debt ceiling issues. What happens when they solve that? The Fed is still doing QT. It, it does not look good for liquidity. And unless there is a meaningful inflection to the upside, these other colored lines have to come down to meet liquidity. So that's 
also something that I want to call out. And then let me uh, let me do one other thing. I'm gonna have to turn a bunch of uh, indicators off for just a minute so that I can do this right. One of the best ways to uh, oops, sorry, wrong thing. One of the best ways to do this. Uh, it, it, like one of the things that has worried me that I've been talking about is breadth in the market. So one of the easy ways to do this is put RSP, which is the equal weight ETF, over SPY. And if you just look, the breadth in the market is gone. There is no breadth in the market. Okay. Uh, you know the the SPY should come should should be down closer to 385, 386, 387, not 410, 411, where it currently is. So this is problematic, OK? Uh, the breadth in the market is gone. Another way that you can do this, uh, let's see let's see if I can do this. Stocks above 50-day moving average. So S&P 500 stocks above their 50-day moving average. And uh, this has been in steady decline, OK? It's below 50. Uh, so you're seeing, again, the, the um, breadth of the market deteriorating pretty significantly, which is usually what happens late market cycle. The breadth disappears. And so uh, I think that these are all reasons. And, and there's, there's many more I could probably talk about, but this video has already gone too long. So uh, I'm just going to stop it right there. My point is, is that you have to be super careful now about uh, what you're doing and the risk that you're taking. Um, if you don't want to completely exit the market, then you should definitely, well, hopefully you hedged this week uh, because right now the prospects for a correction are very high. I, to me, a correction is a very high probability outcome right now in the near term. I'm thinking in the next three weeks uh, is kind of where I'm targeting. Uh, maybe, maybe we can push that out to six. I'm trying not to be uh, so tight on that sort of timeline. Um, because anything can happen, honestly. Um, it could take, you know, two months for this to play out. But my suspicion is that these uh, conditions make for an imminent correction. And so I want to call that out, uh, and I want to caution you guys. And uh, I, and obviously, I didn't even get time to talk about inflation, which you know, maybe maybe I can pull that up. Uh, for just a uh, just a moment, let me put up uh, here. You're looking at my tax signal plot. Uh, actually, let's yeah, let's look at this one. Um, so you've got MGK and the triple Qs uh, and the growth uh, Russell ETF, which are all uh, high, like in the 60s RSI wise, and have a Z score that's positive. So right now they've outperformed what has uh, they've outperformed kind of. Uh, where they have been typically and typically when you see things in the upper right part of this quadrant that usually means that it's due for uh, due for a pullback um, another way to look at it that I like to use is the uh, strength versus volume plot which I'll uh, expand out a little bit right here um, and I think I'm gonna have to pull this forward there we go um, and what you don't want to see in this is you don't want to see all of the uh, the dots and all of the all the uh, uh, ETFs down below the one line because that tells you especially when the market is as high as it is right now because that tells you that there's not a lot of volume and that tells you that the um, conviction in where the markets are at is actually not very high uh, and so uh, I would say that being down in the bottom right quadrant is the worst place to be and there's MGK right there the mega cap growth names uh, not very good uh, so then uh, inflation, uh, so I wanted to specifically, uh, here we go, uh, we'll zoom in on the uh, inflation chart right here on the left side. So people have covered this. We've had, we had basically meaningful declines in median, trim mean, and sticky CPI. Core CPI, though, is hovering around the same level. That, to me, is worrisome. Uh, what, you wanted to, what you would want to see is the rate of change, uh, compounding rate of change declining, just like it is in these other uh, in these other indicators. So uh, to me, that's concerning. If this, if next month CPI leads to core CPI being higher on a three-month compounding annualized uh, rate of change basis, then that's going to be a, a warning siren. Um, and uh, honestly, at this point, I, I actually am, am comfortable with the idea that inflation will be coming down below the Fed funds rate and, um, uh, and that the Fed will pause. I actually don't 
I think the Fed will pause. I don't think there's going to be a rate raise in June unless something crazy happens. Um, and, and to me, now the issue is going to be growth. So we are going to have to shift away from the focus on inflation uh, and now towards growth. Because right now the markets think, oh, inflation's coming off, but the economy's still strong. But once these numbers come off and then the, the growth metrics in the uh, market start to deteriorate, that's where, it's, where I think people are going to freak out about uh, where things are at. And you'll see some market price action uh, in line with, uh, with a growth scare, I think. So anyway, that's where I'm going to stop for today. Thank you for uh, dealing with the longevity of this video, but I think it was really important that I shared with you kind of where things were at. Again, you can follow me on Twitter uh, and on Substack. Those links are in the uh, description below. Make sure you check it out. And uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.